Good afternoon. Welcome everyone. My name is Jerry Taylor. I'm one of the co-chairs for the ACHA COVID-19 Task Force. I'm also the former Associate Dean for Counseling, Health and Wellness at Bentley University and Director of their Health Center. This is the fourth of our series, Ask the Expert. And so far we've covered topics of wastewater testing, testing in general, and management of contact tracing, isolation, and quarantine. The link to those recordings are found on the ACHA COVID-19 resource page, and that page also includes all the latest updates on COVID. Also be sure to check your weekly ACHA COVID-19 update emails and continue to use ACH, ACHA Connect. It's a great resource for all of you. Um, one announcement this week, um, registration has started for the second ACHA COVID-19 summit virtually, and the link will be posted in the chat box at this conference and also on the ACHA website. So for today, feel free to type in a question to the questions pane on your screen, and we'll try to get to all of them as best we can. Finally, we are recording this session and the recording and the slides will be sent to all registrants as well as posted on the ACHA COVID-19 resource page. With that said, let's get going. First of all, I just want you to know we have an unbelievable cast of speakers today, so I'm sure you're gonna enjoy it and get a lot out of it. Next, I'd like to introduce John Miner, who will be leading our discussion. Dr. Miner is a board certified psychiatrist with advanced training in psychodynamic psychotherapy. He's an affiliate faculty member in the Erickson Institute of the Austin Riggs Center in the Berkshires in Massachusetts. He's an instructor of psychiatry at the University of Massachusetts Berkshire Medical Center, the psychiatry residency program, and he served as co-director of the counseling services at Williams College for many years. John is a good friend and I'm happy to have him here today. You can take it away, John. Great, well, thanks, Jerry. Um, and welcome to all of our attendees out there. Um, we've heard that we may have a record today of over 350 registrants. So we uh, figure that we have an important hot topic for you. Um, it affirms the need for having these hot topic discussions that Jerry envisioned when she initiated these at the Ask the Expert series of webinars. So hats off to you, Jerry, about that. And before I introduce our main speaker, Marcus Hoteling, uh, let me first introduce my other co-moderator and longtime colleague, Dr. Nell Davidson, who many of you likely know from her many years of committed service in ACHA, overseeing quality, ongoing, continuing education for ACHA programming. For over 25 years, she was the director of the health service at Case Western Reserve University. And following that career, she's since gone back and received a master's degree in bioethics and medical humanities and is now teaching narrative medicine and practice in the School of Medicine at Case. Uh, Jerry, Nell, and I are all members of the ACHA COVID-19 Task Force, who again originated this series. So now let me introduce our featured speaker for today, Dr. Marcus Hotelling, who's also a longtime friend and colleague. And he is the director of the Counseling Center at Union College in Schenectady, New York. Marcus has also been a longtime colleague within ACHA, where he served in many capacities, including the mental health section chair, program planning, and he's currently leading the ACHA faculty and staff resilience task force uh, that maybe we'll say something about later if we have time. Um, he's also been a leader in the New York State College Health Association right across the Hudson from us and um, is involved in many of the capital regions mental health and substance abuse consortium. As he'll describe, he and his colleagues at Union were confronted with a challenge. And as we all know, necessity is the mother of invention. And today he's gonna to tell us about creating a support service program for students in isolation and quarantine. 
We've already received uh, many submitted questions and we anticipate that many more will be submitted via the question and answer or chat function. Nell and I will do our best to make sure that we address all of the themes that are raised in those questions, but we apologize in advance if we can't get to each one. And with that, let me turn things over to Dr. Marcus Hotelling for his description of Union's Support Squad program, and then we'll open it up for discussion. Thank you, John, uh, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you guys for joining us here this afternoon. Uh, I'm just gonna spend a few minutes describing what we did, um, and uh, then we can get answer the questions. I, I know that there are a lot of questions have already been submitted, and I see some that are coming through now. So I wanna spend more time focused on what the specifics are for you, but I did wanna kind of go into a little bit about what we did and how it can apply to schools large and small. Uh, so if we can go to the next slide. I'm just going to tell you very briefly about Union College, uh, founded in 1795, so we've been around for a very long time. We were the first college chartered by the New York State Board of Regents. We are a highly selective uh, private liberal arts college, uh, but about 35% of our students are part of the engineering program as well. Uh, so big science and technology programs here as well. We are the mother of Greek life, uh, so about 40 to 50%, depending on the year, of our students are Greek. Uh, so that was a concern to us with COVID. Uh, we are a fully residential campus with about 92% of our students living on campus, uh, about 7% of our students living off campus, which literally means right across the street, uh, and about 1% of our students uh, that do commute. Our students are from 30 states and 29 countries, uh, and we do work on a trimester system, which made the whole coronavirus uh, situation a little bit more unique um, uh, because we had our fall and we were just ending our winter when things uh, turned for us. So if we go to the next slide. Um, we had been planning, uh, just like every other school, about what to do uh, with coronavirus uh, as the end of March was rolling around, or excuse me, the end of February was rolling around, beginning of March was ro rolling around. We had set up and we had had multiple meetings um, about that we were going to have our spring break that was supposed to start uh, March 18th. Um, and we were going to do, that was a week and a half spring break. And we were gonna do the first two weeks of our spring term remotely. And we would make a decision based upon uh, how things were trending in the country. That quickly got upended uh, on March 12th, the day before the announcement was supposed to go out to all of our students, faculty and staff about what we've been, pl been planning to do for uh, spring term when a um, administrator was diagnosed um, and we found out the morning of March 12th that a, um, an administrator had been diagnosed with uh, the coronavirus. And to make matters a little bit worse, that um, administrator had been at a um, program the Saturday night prior to, um, to her diagnosis where there were over 50 people, 40 students and 12 faculty and staff members. Uh, it was a, uh, the 50th anniversary of women at Union. It had been an all-male institution up until 1970. So on March 12th, we basically told everyone, you have until Sunday to leave campus. Take your belongings. We will reassess. But right now, we want to make sure that we keep everybody safe. Um, so we had 40 students quarantining on campus in their residence hall rooms and 12 uh, faculty and staff quarantining at their homes. Uh, in follow-up conversations with them, the students were really struggling. And even the faculty and staff that were at homes where they were able to go outside and walk around um, their houses or yards, they really struggled as well. Uh, the students were quarantined in their rooms. They were allowed to leave their room to go to the bathroom uh, because we did not at that point have single bathroom rooms dedicated to them. Um, and we had a cleaner 24 seven in the bathrooms so that whenever one person went in, they would follow after they left and clean the bathrooms. If we go to the next slide. <clears throat> so when we started to look at the return of our students in the fall, because obviously we did not come back for the, um, the spring, we had to really start to look at the New York state rules and how we wanted to do this. 31 states were on the New York state quarantine list uh, and it was a mandated 14-day quarantine. The New York state rules said 
that they could either come and quarantine in one location. They could not move from house to house to house. They had to stay in one location if they were to stay with family or friends. And if they were to quarantine outside of that, they had to basically be put up in hotels. They would not let us quarantine on our campus. They, uh, and that was mostly because of the bathroom issue. Everyone needed an individual bathroom and they could not be with another student in quarantine. So what we did is we contracted with local hotels uh, that are you know, within a block of campus, maybe two blocks, and they were uh, put up in hotel rooms. And once they entered their hotel room, they were not allowed to leave for any other reason except to be taken to the hospital for medical reasons. If we go to the next slide. So in looking at how difficult it was for the students that were on campus as well as uh, in, in the spring, as well as the faculty and staff that had to quarantine, I started doing some research knowing that our students were gonna struggle. And what I came across were numerous studies um, about quarantining and the difficulties that happened. And there was one that really stood out to me that basically 15,000 people who voluntarily quarantined uh, due to SARS between 2002 and 2004 had some significant mental health issues related to that. Uh, now, this is a little bit different as we look at that second bullet point that they were cut off from the rest of the world because they were unable to do normal activities in the fact that everybody right now is cut off from their normal activities. But that doesn't mean that it's any less impactful. Um, and what was really interesting about this study was that, part, that the participants reported that the psychological impact of being depressed, having anxiety, feeling stigma, lasted for months after uh, their quarantine ended. So based on this, and based on the fact that we ha already had 52 people that had to quarantine, we knew we needed to do something different for when our students arrived back on campus. So if you go to the next slide, what we did was we had to abide by the New York State rules. Um, and every single student had to be in a single room with their own bathroom. So again, we contacted, we, we contacted and contracted uh, with local hotels and how it worked was students arrived on campus from wherever they were arriving. Literally, I had a student who uh, um, Ubered from the uh, airport arriving from te Texas, arrived at our field house, got tested and went straight to the quarantine hotel. So, and then, you know, he had left his home in Texas at six o'clock in the morning arrived on campus at 3.30 and was in the hotel by four. So we were testing everyone as they arrived on campus. We, like every other school, said that we were gonna cover the cost of the, ho of the hotels because that's a very expensive uh, endeavor. Initially, we had planned that we were going to have the students cover their own costs for food, but we quickly realized this created a social justice issue uh, and that some students have unlimited resources for food and some students did not. So the school gave every student in quarantine a $300 Grubhub gift card um, that they could use to order meals uh, to, to their hotel room. This not only helped the students, but it also helped local restaurants. And they were very thankful that we did this because uh, we had about 200 students who had to quarantine, that, that chose to quarantine in the hotels. We had many that also chose to quarantine uh, with family friends or family in the state. If we go to the next slide. So we decided that we needed to train and do something to help these students. So we called, what we decided to do was called a support squad. Um, so the vice president of student affairs sent out a campus-wide email. So it didn't just go to student affairs staff, it went to everyone. And they would ask people to volunteer to be part of a team that would support the students uh, in, in this uh, endeavor. And what we decided was the goal was to get everybody down, each support squad member, to be matched with two to three students. We didn't want this to be overwhelming on any one individual on campus, um, but we also felt that two to three students was a reasonable uh, request. If there was a previous relationship, uh, an athletic coach, uh, an academic advisor, we let you pick the students if you knew that they were going to be in quarantine because it was, it, it was natural, it just made sense. The instructions for the, um, the professionals was that, was that they were to either call, text, or Zoom. The first day was a call to all students. And then from there it was, what would you prefer to do? How do you prefer to communicate? And it was to check in on them every day. Uh, it was to check on, in on how they were feeling, to check in on 
you know, basically making sure that they weren't trending downwards in terms of their mental health and to offer um, some resources on campus as well as ways to kind of eat healthy, exercise, and we'll get to that uh, on, on a future slide. One of the things that we made sure of though, especially because if there were previous relationships, we didn't want one student to have something that other students didn't. And one of the first questions that was asked um, from one of our support squad members was, can I drop something off at my support squad students' hotel room doors? Uh, and we decided that was not gonna be in the best interest um, because all of a sudden, you know, people talk and how come this person got homemade cookies or how come this person got this and I didn't get anything. So we, we said, let's not do that. But we then also developed a training for all the sports squad members on what to look for in terms of um, a downward spiral in terms of mental health. If we go to the next slide. So what we did was we developed a 90 minute training and we had about a uh, hundred um, professionals on campus that volunteered to come to this. And it was a 60 minute training um, on what to look for, a little bit on uh, you know, a definition of what a mentor is, how to help. Um, and I'll show you kind of two slides that we use at the end, um, but it was an overview on the research around quarantine, the psychological and phys uh, physical distress um, of quarantine, how to recognize the problems, things that students could do, uh, body weight exercises and hotel room exercises, as well as campus resources. We also had a slide in there about um, our student activities stepped up and they put on an, uh, an hour activity every night. So we had a slide in there about um, what those resources were going to be. So it was trivia, a virtual escape room, little things like that, just something to provide them at least one hour or more of activities um, beyond uh, what they were doing, being stuck in a hotel room, the same four walls for 24 hours a day for 14 straight days. Uh, and again, the rule was the second they walked in, they were not allowed to walk out. Interestingly enough, the first night of our quarantine, our first students, uh, we got a call from the hotel saying that some of the students were wandering around the hallways. Director of Campus Safety uh, and the Dean of Students went down, explained to them they cannot leave their rooms, and then had that same conversation with every single student that checked into quarantine, and we had no problems after that first night. So our students really did take it seriously. Uh, if we go on to the next slide. This is just kind of an example of, uh, you know, some of the material that was in our training. We were, you know, again, I, I'm, a, I'm a clinician by training. Um, you know, it was a lot of basics for mental health providers. So the, my staff knew a lot of the stuff, but, you know, some of the, the academic advisors and the coaches and people from our dining services that volunteered, they might have just called them and said, hey, how are you doing? Uh, good. So we were teaching them how to ask open-ended questions, how to kind of listen, um, really setting up clear boundaries, letting them know they did not need to be a counselor. We expected them to listen and provide resources and information to the students and let somebody know if they were concerned. And then if we just go to the last slide before we get to the questions, this was just another um, way. Uh, so there are some couple do's and don'ts. So, if you, so again, it was, you know, be human, um, show your care and concern, you know, take everything seriously, um, be very direct with the students, don't judge, uh, you know, the students, and offer hope and encouragement. We also did not want them to be the counselor, uh, so if you go down to the don't, um, we didn't want them to cross boundaries, we wanted them to stick with being a support squad member, we did not want them to be a therapist, we wanted them to refer that to the counselor, et cetera. We were very, we, we press this one a lot. Do not say at least. Well, at least it's only 10 more days. At least you only have five more days left in this. We wanted them to empathize with the fact of how difficult it was. Don't act shocked or morally outraged if they were cursing or swearing or frustrated with the situation. Don't tell them that you could be sworn to secrecy with things. And the last part was, was or two more, sorry. Don't argue with them uh, about the rules made no sense, you know, these were the New York State rules. We're still dealing with this with students who are in quarantine now, who argue with the rules. They're not our rules. It's New York State telling us what to do. And then don't assume that the situation would just take care of itself, that if there was a concern, don't sit on it, that they needed to reach out to somebody right away so that we could handle the situation. I 
think that you know something like this could be done at every campus, whether you're a small school like us, where we're 2,200 students, or whether you're Arizona State, where you have 60,000 students, or you know where you can, um, you know, create something like this uh, to help students in quarantine. Um, takes a little bit of effort uh, and a lot of teamwork, but it is definitely something that we can we can accomplish and uh, overcome to, to kind of do this stuff uh, to help our students. So now I think we're gonna be opening it up to questions. Yeah, thank you, Marcus. Uh, as we're kind of collating some of those questions, uh, looking back on it, what, what are some of the thorniest challenges that you uh, experienced in trying to put this support squad together? So the thorniest challenges honestly were, were was confidentiality um, in the sense that we questioned, you know, obviously being, you know, uh, we did this with along with health and counseling. Um, we, we abide by very strict confidentiality rules um, and we needed to obviously understand the FERPA implications of this, um, but we also had to talk about the confidentiality uh, aspects with our um, colleagues that typically don't have to abide by that. Um, so when we did to start, start to see uh, students struggle and if they were part of teams, this came up in one situation where the coach, again, trying to do the best thing that they could do for their, their student athlete, contacted the team captains and said, you know, Sally Smith is really struggling in quarantine She's dealing, you know, she's doing X, Y, and Z. Can you reach out? Well, then that student got very upset that the coach violated her trust. Um, so when we said that, you know, don't keep it secret, we meant from the professionals on campus. So the confidentiality aspect of things of going back to other students was something that um, was a thorny issue. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, there are several questions that have come through about um, exercise and physical activity um, and the sort of taking care of the body, so to speak, yes. during the quarantine. Um, and I know you have some thoughts about that, but why don't you tell us about that? So we included um, some uh, links and I'm happy to share these. Uh, you know, I, I, I could send them uh, to Robin uh, of some links to body weight exercises that you can do uh, in your hotel room. Uh, because obviously they were not going to have weights with them. They were not going to have a treadmill with them. We recognize that they were going to be limited to what they could use in their hotel room. Um, but we know that it's very important to exercise. So we really strongly encourage every student to try to do 30 minutes of exercise every day. Um, and <clears throat> we included some apps that are body weight exercise as well. Um, that students could utilize. Uh, one student actually did bring um, some weights into his room <laughs> with him. He, he moved in 25 pound weights, so he had some weights with him. Um, but we definitely encouraged exercise with body weight uh, because we knew that they weren't gonna have access to the gym at the time. And we encourage all of the support squad members to be encouraging this. Are you exercising? How are you eating? And asking questions like that. Um, have you used these, utilized these apps? Is there anything that we can do to help? Great, thank you on that. Uh, there was one uh, request wondering what the student, what the list of the 14 activities that students had come up with, um, is that on anywhere printable or can you just list a few of those that come to mind? Sure. Uh, so we did a, a, one night was union trivia, uh, you know, trivia about union college. Uh, one night was uh, a movie, so they um, all did a, a watch party um, on Netflix. So if people have Netflix accounts, they could all watch the movie together. And then we did a discussion after the movie, um, uh, just a general music trivia, um, a, an escape room. There's, uh, um, it's a, a couple nights where this, it's called Jackbox. It's, um, I don't know if people remember the game, You Don't Know Jack. Um, but it's basically like a, a bunch of different games that you can play, um, you know, some drawing games, some, you know, you, it's kind of like uh, you, apples to apples where you fill in a word and you have to pick the best word. So we did things like that throughout the, the 14 nights uh, of, that students were quarantining. To, we were trying to make it as fun as possible because we knew that students were really uh, going to be bored. Um, we also try, tried to highly encourage them because there wasn't academic work yet. 
um, the students that are quarantining now, um, they have academics to keep up with. This was two weeks before the term started, so they didn't have any academics. So we encouraged them to bring a book, uh, encourage or some books uh, for leisure reading, and we also encouraged them to kind to come up with a a binge watch uh, you know, movies or series that they were hoping to watch and they just never had time to do. Marcus. Oh, yes. I'm I'm interested in the whole process of how your support squad checked in with students. So I'm interested in things, there've been questions about what kinds of things would they ask? Did you try and come up with a routine? Another question that's come up has been, um, did you have your support squad documenting these check-ins and the content of the check-ins? What, what, as it evolved, what did you think about that? It's a great questions. Um, so um, I will say that the, the check-ins we were supposed to be checking in on, you know, one, just how are you doing? You know, that was the first, you know, how are you doing was the first question we were, at, you know, asking everybody to ask. Um, how were they eating? Were they finding it easy to use the, uh, the Grubhub aspects of things? Were they exercising? Um, and the, again, the first one was done by phone call. Um, the future ones were done at the request of the student. Um, we were encouraging um, all both support squad um, members as well as the students to maintain as close to a schedule as they can because it's very easy to lose track of time when you're stuck in a cell, essentially four walls, you know, your own bathroom and a queen size bed, but that's it. I mean, you have cable TV and things like that, which is nice, um, but you, not being able to leave is very difficult. At first, we were not having them monitor or track uh, or kind of record anything that was being discussed. After we started to see some aspects of um, some mental health concerns, some people going down a little bit in terms of their depression, up in terms of their anxiety, um, my staff and I, as well as health, decided, you know, while we don't want to store these, you know, they're, they're not clinical records, we should be documenting this right, you know, keep them essentially as notes, um, as personal notes, write down the time you called, write down briefly what was discussed, you know, less than a paragraph, a few sentences, um, more for, you know, our ability to kind of track, are we seeing a steady decline, as well as liability issues. Um, you know, that, that was the reality. Um, you know, we did have to be concerned with if something happened, we wanted to be, make sure that we could say, and that was about the fourth or fifth day, that we said, hmm, you know what, we should probably be making sure that people are writing this down um, and keeping, a, keeping accurate records. Yeah, one of, the, uh, one of the attendees had sent in a question about, um, were there any sort of high risk, uh, student at risk situations that came up? And if so, or if you had planned for it, what would be the contingency plan for dealing with those kinds of situations in quarantine students? So that's, that's a great question because when I looked at the list of students that were in quarantine, there were some names that I recognized too well um, that are high risk for mental health um, and that I was certainly concerned about being stuck and isolated in a room for 14 days. Um, so we as a staff worked with, uh, the, the counseling center staff worked with um, the support squad to basically say, if anything comes up, and, and one of the slides that I, I didn't include was a slide on suicidal thinking and suicidal talk. And that if there's any kind of, any indication, even if it's like, you know, I, I didn't wanna wake up tomorrow, something as simple as that, that can be ambiguous in how it's being stated, but, raises any kind of red flags that we wanted them to reach out to us right away um, because we wanted to then be able to say your support squad member was concerned about a statement so now we're reaching out to you and we're contacting you. Um, luckily that did not happen. Uh, believe it or not all of our students um, that were higher risk based upon uh, experiences through counseling and, and what we knew they all made it through quarantine as well as I could have imagined. And we processed this as a support squad, um, how well the students did overall, even though we did see some 
get a little bit more depressed and some get a little more anxious. And we really kind of uh, targeted the reason for it to be that they were really excited about being back on campus or that with the expectation of being back on campus. They were in a hotel, but they had been gone for their entire spring term. So our spring term is 11 weeks. They went home in winter term, the last week of winter term, and they didn't come back until September, well, mid-August, uh, we started class in September. So we think that they were just really excited and we're just counting down the days to be back on campus. Um, <clears throat> one of the, a question came through as you were talking about um, in the sharing of information between the, your clinical staff and the support staff, were there, were there issues around uh, confidentiality in that situation? No, because we didn't, we didn't give them names. We just said if any of the people that you're, if any of the, the students that you're working with say, says anything that is concerning to you, anything at all, you can just give us a call and we can process this together. And based on what's discussed, mm -hmm. we can figure out a plan of action. Um, because we obviously that's something we were concerned about as well. Again, there were probably about three or four students that we know um, have, have had uh, significant suicidal ideation uh, and uh, some attempts in the past uh, that were going to be it, stuck in these hotels for 14 days. But I wasn't going to call up the coach and say, hey, coach, you, you know that this student has attempted suicide in the past. We can't do that. So we just said it to everybody. It was a blanket statement mm -hmm. that if, you know, if, if your gut is telling you something, Here's my cell phone number, you call me. Here's my associate director's cell phone number, you call them. Health center director's phone number, if it was a physical issue, you call them. Um, and we did have one student have to leave for a physical, uh, physical illness that was nothing related to COVID. They went up, they went to the hospital, they were admitted overnight, uh, came back, released from the hospital, came back to campus just to get tested and then straight back into quarantine. We wanted to test that after they got released from the hospital. And then there's one other area that I want to ask about, and then I'll turn it over to Nell for a couple more questions. But uh, there's a lot of interest in uh, what the students' experience uh, what, of this was, um, including like were some of the quarantine students resentful about other students that may have infected them, or um, was there any kind of follow-up with students about their experience of quarantine that might help inform us uh, for future planning? Well, I, I will say this, because um, there's a yes and a no to that question, uh, answer. The, our initial quarantine, absolutely not. There, there was no resentment. There was no hostility. They were all coming back. Um, there was one student that came back from Maryland and checked in on a Monday to the hotel. On Tuesday, New York State took Maryland off the list. So he was resentful that he could, you know, he said, if I would have waited one more day, because uh, he did ask to be released. And once you're in quarantine, you can't leave. Um, but they all understood the, the reasoning and the rationale. Now, um, we do have some resentment. Uh, we have, we've done very well at Union. We're testing every student every week. We went seven weeks without one case. Um, unfortunately, we have had three student cases in the past two weeks. And the new, uh, our county health department is making the school quarantine every student that was in a was in an in person class with that student. Um, so we're working with the, the uh, county health department because it does not make sense. We've already uh, we've made our classes smaller. All they're, they're, all seats are more than six feet away. Every student has to wear a mask. Every student has to have a badge that they check off on on a Namoka app. Um, that indicates that they don't have symptoms. So I had a student that I actually just spoke with on, on Tuesday and he said, I'm doing everything right. The only thing that I quote did wrong here was I went to class. And he said, I'm in here because someone didn't listen to the rules. So now we're starting to see a little bit of hostility. Um, and this is the first, this is the first batch um, that we're finally getting to actually talk to minus the, the, the initial batch of quarantine students that were just happy to be back in New York, happy to be back in the country and happy to be back on campus. So they said, yeah, it was tough being in there and I wouldn't want to do it again, but I'm happy uh, it's done. That, that's what we, with the first batch that we spoke to of the initial group. Now that we're um, starting to see more and more students quarantined um, based upon the positive cases, we are starting to see a little bit more of the frustration um, 
a little bit more of, so we have a student that's back in quarantine from, she came initially for the first two weeks and now just went back in based upon going to class. She hadn't done anything wrong. So she was a little frustrated and tearful when um, she was contacted that she was in proximity and had to go into quarantine. Um, it was not happy with that. Uh, we are doing a quarantine um, support uh, through the mental health aspect. We're doing um, weekly, uh, well, again, this is the first time we've had to do it, um, weekly um, support groups for our students in quarantine. And we email, um, we email the class deans, the deans email the students with the information about the, uh, the quarantine support group. And in that is the fact, because technically I don't know who's in quarantine. It's due, due to the, the confidentiality aspects of things. And we tell them that by attending the quarantine group, they are giving up that confidentiality. We had a huge attendance. No one seemed to care about giving up their confidentiality about being in quarantine. On a campus this small, everyone kind of knows who's in quarantine anyway. Um, oh, the entire track team, or oh, all of these, this class is in there. So, um, and in that group, we talked about, again, how to take care of yourself mental health wise, staying connected with people, using different forms of communication, not always using Zoom, using text, using Snapchat, using the phone, which is dreaded for this, this generation to actually call somebody and talk on the phone. Um, you know, you're, I, you know, I actually said to the students, you know, your parents would actually like that. You know, as much as they like to see your face sometimes, they would, might just want to hear your voice. Um, and then we also talked about the body weight exercises again and how you, you know, making sure they're keeping active. Um, we, are, uh, we worked with dining because um, they were getting a lot of pasta uh, initially. Um, they had pasta three nights in a row, just in different forms and not a lot of protein. Uh, so we were getting a lot of complaints about that uh, after our first, um, our first group. And we just called, called dining and, he's, and they said, oh, you know what? Yeah, we can easily change that. While they're not taking orders, they did increase the portion size and give more protein. Great. Mel? Um, so I want to ask you a little bit more about these wonderful support squad people you had. There's yep. some people who wanted to know if you pay them. Um, uh, I had a question following up what you were talking about and the learning kind of that goes on with those people since they aren't counseling people. Um, did you meet with them on a regular basis together so they could begin to learn more about the situations that were causing some difficulty or did that only go on on a one-on-one -on -one basis? And another question I had was, if, if somebody on the support squad identified a student who um, they wanted to, my understanding of your, how your system worked was is if a student in quarantine had a medical question or had a counseling question, your support squad person would refer them directly to a professional in one of those two offices and then put them in contact with that person for the confidential way of resolving that problem. Have I got that understood correctly? That is 100% accurate. Um, you know, we had a, a resource page was the last page of our um, presentation to the support squad members. And that had the different resources, um, mm -hmm. the Dean's office, we also included uh, the various members of religious and spiritual life uh, because we wanted to make sure that those students that wanted to observe their um, religious practices could do so in a manner that was consistent with their beliefs. And we had all four members um, who, uh, who are faculty members um, of our Office of Spiritual Life, uh, Religious and Spiritual Life volunteer to be on the support squad. Um, so we were able to uh, have, um, you know, as close to a service or, uh, you know, as possible uh, for the various religious uh, entities of, of our campus. Um, we also had, um, uh, you know, so th there was, it was always a, a handoff, a warm handoff of, I'm going to introduce you to Marcus, or I'm going to introduce you to so-and-so um, who might be better to answer your, be a, better able to answer the question, because we did not want them to answer questions. And, and Again, one of the training, part of that training was, it's okay to say, I don't know, mm -hmm. and to let them know you will do, the, do your best to get them the answer. Um, 
the first question was, were they paid? No, this was strictly volunteer. Um, <clears throat> um, I will be 100% honest. We did have to furlough. Um, we furloughed many of our dining workers uh, and we, uh, the school during the spring term. And the, the, they also furloughed um, a number of assistant coaches during the spring term. This came back after the new financial, uh, our, our fiscal year started July 1st, and we launched the support squad late July. I think this was certainly a way for people to say, hey, I'm useful, don't furlough me again. Um, but I also think, you know, union is a family. We, I mean, it was hard to see people furloughed. Um, and we do consider our, you know, we are a community. So I think the fact that we put this call out and there were just so many volunteers did not surprise me in the least. Um, have you gotten any feeling that, um, and I suppose you may have more experience with it now as your numbers have grown, if um, any of these support squad people began to feel overwhelmed by the task? And, and I would imagine that's the thing that could happen now and as we move forward, when, especially in campuses where there have been many larger numbers. I will say that uh, during the summer, no. Uh, you know, even though we were all being stretched a little bit thinner than we wanted to be in the summer, um, nobody expressed, uh, you know, it was, it was three phone calls a day or three Zooms a day um, in talking with the coach uh, that their, their team is in uh, quarantine because they were practicing in pods and one of them uh, tested positive. So that pod of seven are all down in the hotel right now. Um, he's checking in with all of them. Uh, and he said, you know, doing this on top of my normal activities on, uh, you know, on top of trying to figure out if we're even gonna have a season is draining. And uh, that's where I said, you know, one, you have an assistant coach. It's okay to turf three of them to the assistant coach. You don't have to be the one to check in with all of them. You can send them an email every day just saying, hey, thinking of you guys, but have your assistant coach check in with three or, and you can check in with four. Um, and then the other thing that I reminded uh, the, the coach was that, you know, there are other resources on campus so that if he is concerned, you know, he can contact us. I also said, have them all come to the, to, to the, um, the support group in, so that they can see that they're not alone in this. They're all, most of the students that are in quarantine are talking to each other anyway. Uh, they, again, they all kind of know who they are um, without, you know, anyone telling them. Uh, you know, I think it just kind of goes out, they snap out, you know, we're, we're more concerned about confidentiality than they are. You know, we're calling them saying, you know, hey, we're sorry this is happening. You, you have to go to quarantine, somebody will be coming to pick you up, pack these things, and they're snapping as we're talking to them. Oh, I guess I'm going to quarantine and, you know, to, to 50 of their friends. Now, you mentioned early on when I asked you um, that the conversation when somebody was going to quarantine was substantially different than the, the conversation when they were going to isolation because they tested positive. Could you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Uh, so my vice president actually asked me that this is my task besides this uh, support squad was to create scripts for, um, for how to talk to somebody if they're going to quarantine or isolation. And then also um, how we could talk to students um, if they were concerned about being exposed. Now, the concern about being exposed one, uh, I wrote up and it was kind of like, and I, and I sent it to her and I said, it's kind of amorphous because I don't know how it's going to look. You, know, you never know how it's going to look. So it's more kind of like, you can say this, you can say this, you can say this. Uh, the one that for um, quarantine and isolation was pretty clear cut. Um, you know, the, the one that uh, our, our, our um, health services office contacts the students that are testing positive. Uh, so they are very well versed in what they are going to say and what needs to happen and where they're going to isolation. So the script that I wrote was for um, those that are going to quarantine. Almost every single time it's who tested positive. They want to know who they were around. We can't say that, obviously, due to confidentiality. And um, it's, you know, these are things in bold and, and very clear. You know, just answer, unfortunately, I can't answer that question. Be as positive as you can. And it's a very kind of clear, you know, you know, guiding them through what they need to get in their 
in their uh, residence hall room, helping them understand uh, the resources available to them on campus, um, who will be contacting them every day, their class dean contacts them every day to check in on work, um, who their support squad member is going to be, um, is something that uh, is in the script, uh, and then who will be picking them up because we have campus safety, they have a set uh, car for quarantine uh, transportation back and forth to the hotel, um, but they only take one person at a time. Uh, so it's a very long process when we have to quarantine 25 people um, from who were either in an in-person class or around somebody that tested positive. That can take from five o'clock when we get the positive test result till nine or 10 o'clock to get everybody set in the hotel. Oh, you're on mute, Bill. Speaking of which, can you comment about um, roles with regard to parents who you might not typically speak with. I'm wondering about parental notification. I'm wondering about parents wanting to send, I heard in one school had a lot of parents sending special food and treats. Um, I'm wondering about um, how students are relating to parents when they're put in isolation or quarantine. Um, obviously students uh, communicate with their parents. We do not tell the parents that they're going to quarantine uh, due to FERPA rules. Uh, we, we cannot. Um, <clears throat> however, um, we encourage them to tell, talk to their families. And so far we know that pretty much everyone who has been in quarantine has notified their parents. Um, the parents have called, not my office, but the Dean of Students office to ask if they could send something to their student in quarantine. Um, and what they could do, could they come visit? Absolutely not, they cannot come visit. They cannot come look out the, you know, kind of the nursing homes that, that we had a parent ask, can they come sit outside the window? No, you cannot do that. Um, but we did say that they could send things to the hotel and the hotel would bring it to the outside their room and knock on the door and let them know that it was there. We can't stop parents from um, deliver, er, sending things. We as a college are not, um, allowing faculty members or coaches to bring anything special to the students. They are getting three meals a day from dining. Um, and if they did forget something in the residence hall room, like medication or a textbook, we are delivering that, but we are not delivering anything special and no kind of special things. But um, so far we have been getting calls. Uh, we uh, typically get the calls from at the, at the counseling center, the parents of anxious students um, that they're concerned that they might be now have COVID based upon that they're in quarantine, they were around someone who was diagnosed. Um, and what we try to do is work with the parents and then we reach out to the student. You know, I, I work with the, the parent to say, you know, okay, I'm gonna reach out to your son or daughter. Um, and we reach out and offer a, a triage appointment. Uh, and then also, to, you know, in those appointments, it's really just kind of, monitoring your symptoms, what's the likelihood of transmission. Obviously, we can't say that you are 100% in the clear, but here are the steps you can take to um, make sure that you're monitoring your symptoms, make sure you're monitoring your anxiety around this, um, and we're testing them. <laughs> so uh, we'll, we could say, look, you're going to get tested twice while you're in quarantine. You're going to know before you leave quarantine that at that moment in time of testing, you are negative. Obviously, the time, you know, once you leave quarantine and once you, you know, we can't control that. So we, we are very clear with that as well. So Marcus, I had a question about um, staff, your counseling staff, and um, as well as the, the squad members. You yeah. know, what do you find as far as their needs? We always think of caring for the caregiver and what specific things are you seeing that's working and been effective? So that's a great question. Um, you know, I think that all of us, you know, so I'll, I'll just speak for union because um, I know some campuses are seeing a decline in the number of appointments because um, not everyone's back. Um, we have seen a, a significant increase in the number of first year students seeking services than we ever have. Um, and we have our, we're also up 30% in terms of the number of sessions that we've provided uh, during this time. So we're seeing um, a, a significant increase. One of the things that I've done is I have put in at the end of my staff meeting, a check-in. Uh, it's literally self-care check-in. 
And what we do is we spend three minutes at the end of staff meeting, just seeing how everybody's doing. Is there anybody that wants to share anything? Anybody doing anything fun uh, this week? And what are we doing for self-care? Um, and I practice what I preach. I, I'm always saying like, eat right, sleep right, and exercise. I say that to almost every single student. Um, so we talk, you know, one of my, uh, one of my staff members has a Peloton. So I'll, I'll, I know that she uses it and I'll say, Nalani, uh, how many miles did you do this weekend? And she'll, you know, she'll, she'll bring it up. We kind of do the same thing with the support squad. We say, is there anything you need? And also, how are you doing? You know, and, and I, I was told by the same coach who said he was feeling overwhelmed. He said, you know, the fact that you even asked that is really nice. He said, I feel like, you know, he's like, you know, and again, we're a community. He, uh, so he said, you know, everyone's kind of looking out for each other, but we're all working really hard. He said, but you know, so important to them to have you as that caring person. Really appreciate that, Marcus. I just want to see whether John and Nell have any final questions. We've got about mm, eight minutes left. I have one final question, but I'll wait and let John and Nell take a shot first and then I'll finish up. Well, yeah. just to, just to uh, capture some of the other comments, there's a number of questions about whether there are open spaces, courtyards, or anything that are allowable around this need for exercise uh, and fitness. And then there's another sec, uh, set of questions about what's your current census in the quarantine program and what was that a, a program that was just uh, busy at the beginning of the semester or do you continue to have students uh, in and out of that program? So um, unfortunately, New York State has said that they cannot go outside once they're in the hotel room. Um, and that was something that we were a little frustrated with because one of the hotels that uh, we have uh, our students in is right on a river that has a nice green space right outside. Now, I wouldn't recommend going swimming in the river, but definitely use the green space. Um, but we were told, nope, once they are in there, they cannot leave. So that was definitely hard for us to hear, harder for the students to hear. Um, the question about the census. Um, we did have a, a scare where we had to quarantine students um, for about four days as we were waiting for some tests that came back mixed. So we, we had some students kind of going into quarantine. That was about uh, 25 students. Um, now with these three positive cases over the last two weeks, we have 110 students in quarantine right now, um, which is a lot uh, considering we're a school of 2,200. Um, and that is that, that has been difficult uh, in terms of definitely hard on dining. Uh, you know, they're delivering three meals a day while still trying to cook for the other, you know, 20, 2,100 students on campus. Um, and uh, it's hard for some of the support squad members uh, who are taking, taking more on than they should be um, and also doing their full-time jobs now uh, that they, you know, that, that's in full swing now that we're back in the term. So it, it, it's ebbed and flowed. Um, I have a feeling as we start to see the flu and coronavirus in the winter, we're gonna see more cases of quarantine because we just won't know. So we'll be doing shorter stints of quarantine once, as we're testing people uh, and it, we find out it's just the flu. And then we'll bring students back to campus. No, how about? Um, I, one other person asked, and this is a little complex, um, but I, I think it's an interesting question. Those of your students who might have emotional service, uh, emotional support animals or service animals in their rooms, are they allowed to take those to quarantine? And then what happens with them? So we did arrange with um, the hotels uh, that we do have a few students with emotional support animals um, uh, and one or two students with service animals. Um, the service animals were not a problem. Um, obviously, the, they, the, the hotel said not a problem at all. They did question the emotional support animals um, and they asked what they were. Um, essentially, if it's something that does not need um, significant care, we do have um, one student that has um, rats, uh, three rats, um, and has used those uh, since she's been 11 uh, to calm herself down. We, we talked with her and we said, if you get quarantined, what's the plan? Because we were not gonna care for them. The hotel was not gonna let 
then come in. She's somewhat of a local student, uh, you know, within driving distance. So they, we arranged with her that her parents or mother or father would come and pick up the rats. We would take them out of the residence hall because we we're not allowing anybody in the residence hall unless it's, uh, they live in the residence hall and they would transport them home. It sounds like the best thing is to have a plan, to yes. make sure students have a plan. Even the students without a support animal to have a plan, just in case they're going into quarantine or isolation, to have their a bag, a little bag packed and be ready to roll. Thank you so much, Marcus. Yeah. My question to you, just to tie it up, we've got about five minutes left, is just, um, do you have one thing that you um, would add to what you're doing for the spring or um, one lesson learned that you feel you wish you had done differently? That's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think, in the, you know, actually this ties back into the um, resilience piece of this uh, and the self-care piece of this is I think uh, that what we would be doing differently, and I know my vice president is pushing for this, is to give um, people just in general like across campus time. You know, we've all been working way harder than we typically do, way more hours. We're responding to emails well into the night. Um, and, you know, one of the pushes she's making is to give us some time off that we typically don't have time off. So this summer, the president um, sent out an email and said, okay, this Friday and the next Friday, nobody's working. We're shutting down campus. And that's never happened. I've been here 14 years. We don't even get snow days. I mean, every other college in the, in, in the area gets a snow day, but since we're all on campus, they're like, no, you guys can come, you know, drive through the snow and, and see these students. Um, and that made a big difference. And I, I think a lot of people appreciated that. So I think one of the things I've learned are the little tiny things that senior staff can do, um, even if it's just a thank you. Um, you know, the, the president came by uh, uh, last Friday, actually, a week ago, and just came into the health center uh, and said, I, I know this is ground zero. I want to thank you guys. I want to thank you for all the hard work. And the nurses were through the roof. They were like, he, he recognizes how hard we're working. Uh, we just, Marcus, got a, a little chat from someone who was a student at Union while you were a counselor at the Wellness Center and that you are fabulous. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> so glad to see him provide his knowledge to all of us. What a way to close this. <laughs> well, thank you very much, whoever said that. I really appreciate it. It was that. really special. Thank you so much, um, Marcus, for a great job. And thank you, John and Nell, for your great questions. Um, we're at the end of our time. And um, uh, I, this was just great. And I think people can implement these, um, this idea in their schools, regardless of size. And I think the other piece is, let's just remember to thank each other and thank your staff if you are in an administrative position. Those little things are really important at this time when people are really struggling. They may not show it because they're all um, strong and resilient, but inside they are having a difficult time, I am sure. Um, our Ask the Expert series will take a little break over the holidays and we intend to start again after the new year. Um, don't forget to sign up for the virtual summit for December 8th and 9th. A lot of good information will be presented there on COVID and taking care of the caregiver as well. Please stay safe and take care of yourselves. Thank you so much for attending today and thanks so much to our speakers. You are outstanding. Thank you. Thank you.